हेलो हेलो गुड इवनिंग एंड नमस्कार टू ऑल ऑफ यू एस्टीम्ड सीनियर मेंबर्स ऑफ द फिलोसॉफी फैमिली रिस्पेक्टेड फिलोसॉफी फैकल्टीज and the resource persons of different sessions and of course resource person of today's evening members of the organizing committee dr kailash chandra maharana sir dr k om narayan rao sir and uh, devashi sarangi and my dear student friends today is the 12th day of western philosophy series today we have with us as the resource person sri pramod kumar das sir and mrs nivedita priyadarshini as moderator today's resource person uh, pramod kumar das actually needs no introduction he is the chief architect of the taj mahal that is philosophy family as a student he was brilliant and as a teacher he is simply excellent for the last 10 to 12 days he was fighting emotionally so that he will reach to us philosophically actually his wife was in intensive care unit she had an accident now of course she is fine and she moved to general ward so on behalf of the philosophy family we all wish her speedy recovery coming to today's resource person sri pramod kumar das sir i can simply say he is not only talks philosophy rather he lives in philosophy presently he is working as the head of the department department of philosophy noyagad autonomous college Nayagar, Odisha. Today he is going to speak on the philosophy of Immanuel Kant, and particularly on Copernican revolution, synthetic a priori judgments, etc. Kant. When we talk about Kant's philosophy, Kant is famous for three critics. That is the critic of pure reason, critic of practical reason, and critic of judgment. Kant's critics are just like jigsaw puzzles. Once some pieces are in place, it becomes progressively easier to figure out what other pieces must look like. His philosophy is like a crossroad, which opens up new ideas and new systems like subjective idealism, objective idealism, pragmatism. logical positivism and so on and so forth so with this i welcome you all to this webinar program and uh, now i am requesting sri pramod kumar das sir to address the participants on the topic on the given topic that is philosophy of immanuel kant pramod sir please Hello. Ah uh, yes, madam. Yes, madam. Am I audible? Am I audible? Yes, sir. You are audible. Okay. <clears throat> Respected um, Dr. Kalyani Sodangi, my big sister. Respected Dr. Kailas Chandra Maharana. Respected Dr. K. M. Nanan Rao. My dear brother. the basis sadangi and very esteemed participants today we shall discuss the philosophy of immanuel kant <clears throat> so far in the history of philosophy 
we we are discussing about what philosophy is kant was interested in speaking of a philosopher what a, what should be what should like a philosopher what is the nature of a philosopher what is the duty of a philosopher what is the vision of a philosopher kant <coughs> not only made a revolution in philosophy he paved the path of a perfection in living a beautiful life human life honest life in other words Kant was a very honest man. He was honest in morality. He was honest in intellectuality, and he was honest in spirituality. Philosophical thinking should not be confined to mere analysis. or near scientific inquiry philosophy call in philosophical inquiry should be very comprehensive it should cover all the aspects of human life cognitive cognitive and affective satyam sevam sundaram truth and knowledge that is one part perfection morality that is another aspect of man and willing will power that is also another part of our sundar si beauty sense of a beauty sense of a beauty aesthetics so kant has emphasized basically the three aspects of human life that is cognition then cognition then affection knowing willing and feeling with that uh perspective kant has worked in three in these three areas and his uh enterprises his uh works are well known one is am i audible yes sir you are audible okay Sofaraj cognit Sofaraj co Sofaraj cognit cognitive perfection is concerned. Kant has beautifully discussed in his critique of pure reason. Sofaraj morality is concerned. Kant has beautifully discussed in his work critique of practical reason. and so far as the sense of a beauty kant has worked through his critique of judgment and kant kant is convinced of the fact that these three aspects such as knowledge knowledge morality and the sense of a beauty these three aspects make a man complete according to kant this nature is very beautiful 
we should see the beauty in the nature beauty in human personality beauty in nature and beauty in human personality man man should live a beautiful life there is a, there is an aesthetic sense and man should have that sense that is discussed in critic of judgment and man should live a very moral life and kant is kant is famous for his uh, theory of morality categorical imperative good will the universal or uh, principle of uh, um, principle of uh, morality and every man is an end in himself such things uh, are very um, clearly discussed in uh, critic of a practical reason and kant is uh, very much famous for his theory of morality and in critic of a pure reason kant says what should be the status of knowledge now we shall uh, focus on uh, critic of a pure reason for kant the method uh, kant also introduced a method in philosophy as all other philosophers <coughs> um, have already introduced their own methods for example if we shall start from bacon bacon is famous for his method inductive method bacon said that knowledge should be should give a new information and only inductive procedure can give us new information newness knowledge the status of knowledge should be newness we should we should we should get new information if if knowledge does not give new knowledge new information that is not knowledge i know something means i some i know something new and in inductive procedure we always get a new information not in deduction in deduction the conclusion is already contained in the premises so the conclusion does not give us any new information very shortly we can say that bacon is famous for its inductive method similarly decker followed his method of universal doubt he said that knowledge should be knowledge should be self evident knowledge should be universal knowledge should be uh, rational <coughs> and that no, truth truth should be self evident so universal doubt is the method of decker then come come spinoza in spinoza we we find spinoza established a method that there shall be a fundamental principle by which everything can be explained so this method leads to monism and he says that there is substance and substance is the ultimate principle and from that ultimate principle we can explain everything there then he introduced attributes and uh, attributes and modes and he he is also famous for his method uh, of uh, uh, the fundamental principle one principle then comes uh, leibniz leibniz introduced a method leibniz introduced a method in philosophy according to leibniz that the highest principle can explain the world and the smallest principle 
can explain the world as well. Spinoza said only the or only one principle, the, the world is explained by one principle that is substance. So that was one way traffic. He uh, started from substance and uh, reached at modes through attributes. Substance can explain modes, but modes cannot explain the substance. So we cannot go backward from modes to substance. But Leibniz introduced a method that is monadology. He said that uh, everything can explain everything. Everything, if you take anything, that can explain the totality. The highest Anu and Bhuma. In Adita Vedanta, it is called Anu and Bhuma. The highest principle can explain everything, and the lowest principle can explain everything. This is uh, a unique method that is introduced by uh, Leibniz. Then come to Locke, John Locke. John Locke said that only John Locke's method is uh, epistemological by nature. He says that uh, we shall start our philosophical inquiry from the uh, origin of uh, knowledge. Uh, the, and the origin of knowledge is from sense experience. So sense experience is the only source of knowledge and that is the fundamental principle. And if this is the principle, then its, um, its conclusions will be accordingly, will, will follow accordingly. If, uh, if everything is perceived and if we accept the truth as per it, uh, according to uh, our perception, then there is a, there is a, a doubt whether substance, uh, the knowledge of substance is ascertained or not. He says, substance is there as the ontological ground, but I know not what. I cannot know, I cannot ascertain the existence of substance, but logically we, we can say the substance must exist as the uh, ground of uh, the existence of the qualities. So where from uh, this conclusion um, came? Now from his method, that the method, the epistemological method, that knowledge is only knowledge by perception. Then, come, then comes Berkeley, what Berkeley said, to be is to be perceived. This is the method of Berkeley. To be is to be perceived. If, if we can speak of existence of anything, then the fundamental principle is that it must be perceived. If we do not perceive anything, then we cannot say, we cannot ascertain its existence. So his method is to be, is to be perceived. Then comes Hume. Hume says that whatever is distinguishable, that is separable. That, that means our perceptions, our sensations are discrete. There is, low, there is no logical connection between them. If this, this is the principle, then what shall be the conclusion? And there is no substance at all, no matter, no mind, no God. Then comes Kant. Kant's unique method is synthetic a priori judgment, and we shall discuss that. How, uh, how, um, how is it the method of uh, Immanuel Kant? <clears throat> so, I described, I described the methods of philosophers from Bacon to David Hume. Now the question comes, do these philosophers justify their methods? Suppose I introduce a method. I have liberty, I have freedom to introduce a method. Then it is my moral duty, it is my moral duty to justify that method. But Kant, Kant, Kant uh, observed that all these philosophers have failed somehow or other to justify their methods. 
for example uh, again we shall start from bacon how bacon failed in his method how decker failed in his method how spinoza failed in his method bacon gave the um, introduced the inductive uh, method and induct by inductive method we cannot speak of the universality we we cannot speak of universality even if we generalize even if we generalize a statement that that, that generalization is subject to uh, probability we cannot we cannot ascertain the uh, certainty of the conclusion induction cannot gives up give, gives us uh, certain knowledge or the certitude uh, so that is the problem of induction so induction in the history of a philosophy bacon's method has no use at all no where we see rather rather mills mills procedure of induction is better used uh, mills contribution is more than bacon so that is not so, the inductive method is not so useful bacon um, then comes decker decker gives universal doubt universal doubt as a method it is all right as a method it is all right but if we speak of uh, only innate ideas are there some innate ideas are there innate ideas are useless if they do not explain if they do not uh, uh, describe the uh, facts if innate ideas are only confined to mind and they have they are not connected to the uh, practical world then that is not the proper philosophy so descartes uh, this is, that is also the limitation of descartes spinoza spinoza introduced a method that is spin uh, soft there is one substance and by that one principle he tried to explain everything but so far as the modes are concerned so far as the walls are concerned spinoza the philosophy of spinoza spinoza tried to explain the world but in course of his explanation he actually explained away the world explained away the world so that is that we, that that ended in speculation and in leibniz 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 is <coughs> introduced a very uh, very uh, beautiful method that is monadology and like according to leibniz leibniz also the philosophy of leibniz and immanuel kant um, is very uh, similar uh, in many many ways leibniz says that uh, no perception is possible without conception we cannot have we can we we cannot even perceive anything if our mind is not involved there so that so to the, to that extent uh, can't can't is uh, we can say that can't follows leibniz uh, but 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 leibniz leibniz uh, rationalism was ended ended in in a type of a dogmatism because uh, we cannot ignore we cannot ignore the practical world conceptual world conceptual uh, clarity conceptual uh, discussion uh, is not sufficient because we human beings we live in the practical world there are many practical problems leibniz philosophy is more philosophical it is not a practical it is not a critical but man man is not a philosopher according to kant man is not a philosopher man is not only a philosopher man, ha man has some moral responsibility man is a social being man lives in society man lives in this practical world so the practical world should not be ignored so this is the position of rationalism they speak of a priori or innate ideas but through innate ideas we cannot explain satisfactorily we cannot touch satisfactorily the objectivity of the world
the objectivity is ignored in rationalism. Similarly, the universality and necessity are ignored in empiricism. Locke, Locke, Berkeley, Hume, they also introduced their methods, but there are also many problems. Berkeley said that to be is to be perceived. To be is to be perceived. This is the method of Berkeley. But Berkeley did partiality. If we shall take this principle in the strict sense, then how can we say mind exists? How can we say God exists? So here, uh, in, in, in those periods, philosophy was not free from politics. They, uh, they, we are fearing the philosophers, we are fearing and the um, uh, popes of the church. So uh, they were uh, bound, they were not free, they were bound to introduce God somehow or other. Otherwise, they will not stand, they will, they, they cannot, uh, when their thesis will not be, as our priest thesis uh, um, uh, get approved by the scholars. Similarly, the, the thought of the philosopher is not, um, should be approved by the religious system. So, a philosopher was bound to introduce God, even if, it does not suit uh, uh, the method, uh, method of uh, uh, those philosophers. If to be is to be perceived, it is taken in the strict, strict sense. Then how can we say uh, God exists? Do we perceive God? So Descartes, uh, sorry, Berkeley very partially rejected matter, like stepmother. And he, he uh, accepted mind and God as a substances. Then comes Hume. Hume rejected all. That, that, that become, Hume uh, followed that principle, to be is to be perceived in very strict sense. What Berkeley um, uh, could not do, that Hume uh, proved. And Hume did that. Hume said, if to be is to be perceived, it's taken in the strict sense, then not only matter is not perceived, but also mind is not perceived, and God is not perceived, no substance is perceived, therefore nothing exists. No substance exists. But what is the problem of, problem of a Hume? Hume says everything, everything is subject to change, even mind does not exist, body does not exist, God, God does not exist, that, that is manage, manageable. But when philosophers say mind does not exist, the person does not exist, not only David Hume, uh, I shall speak of uh, Buddha and Heraclitus, those who, those who advocate the same thing, the question comes to them, if, uh, who says? Who says that uh, um, uh, mind does everything, everything is momentary? Who says? Who says? Who says that everything is momentary? Who says that everything is changing? Who says that everything is discrete? Who says that, that there is no logical connection between the ideas? Who says? If somebody says that, that means that, that that person is permanent. That person is permanent. Who is claiming David Hume? David Hume is permanent. Who is saying, who is propagating that everything is tense? If everything is discrete, who is saying that everything is discrete? This problem is there. Those, not only David Hume, those philosophers who speak up that, that everything is a uh, uh, flux, Everything is a, uh, only a flow of sensations. There is no mind, no body, no, um, no mind, no body, no God. Then who is he, uh, speaking that? Who is saying that everything is changing? So there must be an unchanging principle, unchanging ent entity, at least I, who 
is who who can claim that everything is changing. Kant says, I shall introduce such a method that all these problems right from Bacon to David Hume shall be shall be resolved. Shall be resolved because Kant Kant was uh, interested in the uh, nature of knowledge. He says that yes, from um, perception, um, from uh, perception we start knowing. Percepts from uh, perception is the beginning of knowledge, but from perception, knowledge uh, knowledge does not. We can say that only from the perception knowledge originates. Origination and uh, the starting point, they are different. Yes, knowledge starts from perception, but we cannot say that knowledge only, only originates from perception, as Locke said. Locke said that um, from perception, knowledge starts, and from perception, knowledge originates. That means perception is the only source of knowledge, and whatever is not um, whatever is not uh, approved by our perception, we are doubtful about that existence. But according to Kant, Kant says, be, be a very common man. Kant was very honest. He was he's the person who is honest, not, the person who is honest, he is honest in all the aspects of human life. He should be honest in intellectuality, he should be honest in morality, and he should be honest in spirituality, he should be honest in all the aspects of human life. Can't, I, I, was, I was just reading his childhood uh, life, Kant spent his childhood life at very early age, he was giving tuition to the uh, children, he was a tutor. in different families. I, I felt very shocked. There was such a great philosopher uh, who was working in different families. And then uh, he struggled and he, he, his child was, was very struggling. And then he um, joined as a lecturer in mathematics and physics. And later on, he became a professor of logic and metaphysics. In our country, what we see, suppose somebody is a philosophy lecturer, then he will select which subject he will study. Suppose somebody will say, I can teach Indian philosophy and I cannot teach Western philosophy. If I can teach uh, Wittgenstein, then I cannot teach um, uh, Advaita Vedanta. But, uh, but in that, in those period, uh, one person Oh, when he he was he, he was uh, appointed uh, in multiple subjects, that one he be lecturer in mathematics and physics. Later on, a professor of logic and metaphysics. Discipline, multi-discipline, a lecturer or a professor in multi-disciplines. So this this was the. Um, versatile uh, talent of uh, Immanuel Kant. And by, uh, as a man, he was very honest. So now he says, be a man, be a man, be a common man, silent your mind, silent your mind. And, and you see actually what is happening, what is happening. What is the nature of knowledge? From which knowledge originates? From which knowledge originates? Each perception enough? Question. Kant, Kant said what, what, what should be like a philosopher? A philosopher should know the art of asking question. A philosopher should know the art of asking question. Asking question is very important than giving answer in philosophy. From your question, 
it can be said it can be inferred it can be um, it can be certified that uh, what is depth of your knowledge what types of question you ask in i see in the webinars uh, people just ask questions for the sake of asking questions <coughs> But the art of asking question, just I am, just I am, uh, one minute. <coughs> so innocently, innocently ask questions, very pertinent questions. And pertinent questions will come here when 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 our mind is silent. Silently observe what is happening, and then you ask the question. So the first question is: Is perception enough? Is um, rationality enough? Perception or empiricism. But the, the source of our knowledge as the perception, if we say, can it give us complete knowledge? If our processor is knowledge, my, my perception, can it give us, uh, the, is, it, is, it, is it the philosophy of a person or is it the real status of knowledge? That is the question. Yes, somebody says that perception is the source of knowledge and we say that John Locke says that perception is the source of knowledge and Descartes says is there to ask yourself is it the status of knowledge? Can we say that um, Man is only confined to his perception. Yesterday, uh, when Madam was uh, speaking about David Hume, somebody asked a question, perhaps Dr. Rao asked a question to Madam, that what is the contribution of uh, David Hume to uh, the society, to, to, to the science? Madam, Madam very honestly said, there is no contribution of David Hume, but it is a standpoint. It is a standpoint of David Hume and philosophy believes in, his, in, believes in standpoints. So that is true. If, from, if, if I speak something uh, from one standpoint and that is, I shall say that that is my philosophy, okay. But that is not the true nature of our inquiry. When we say that uh, I am talking, I am talking about, or I am experiencing my uh, source of knowledge or the origin of knowledge, then I should be very honest in my inquiry. Very honest. If I say, if, uh, if I shall say that um, only perception is the source of knowledge, then I am not honest because I ignore rationalism. If I say that only reason is the source of knowledge, then I am not honest because I ignore imprecision. I am not honest in the sense because I am ignoring the contribution of the faculty, one faculty. Because both imprecision and rationalism make our knowledge complete and perfect. And that is the reality, that is the fact. The source of knowledge, the origin, origin of knowledge is, is a fact. We experience that. What we experience something, but when we rationalize it, when we philosophize it, we speak something else, then it is dishonesty. So, so Kant, whenever Kant speaks of morality, duty for the sake of duty, he is very honest in speaking of that. That we cannot say something is moral if it is not universally accepted, if it is not impartially accepted. This is the honesty in speaking of morality. Similarly, whenever we, we speak something, we think something, we philosophize something, we, we should not give our personal view. We should not give our personal, uh, we should not share our personal philosophy. We, we should 
be blank we should be honest we should be silent and we shall observe what really the fact is now can't can't observe that yes perception is necessary we cannot ignore perception because because the external world is the counterpart of my existence whenever i find myself i always find or i always find myself with an external world so knowledge whatever i know i know through my perception i have i have sense organs my sense organs give give some information about this world should we ignore this this is the question should we ignore this i do can't say suppose i am can't i shall say i am not advocating any implicit philosopher or any rationalist philosophers forget them suppose there is no bacon no decker no spinoza no leibniz no locke no berkeley no him nobody is there no no predecessors are there suppose kant is the first philosopher suppose i am the first philosopher just ask to yourself do not we need the external world for our knowledge do not i i have my i that, that my i is seeing something my my sense organs my sense organs perceive the external world it is it is a fact it is not a philosophy whatever kant says kant speaks of the fact the very common sense fact it is there is that is no philosophy at all that that is honesty in philosophy when you come to the come to, when the, when a philosopher speaks the fact that philosopher is a honest philosopher if we just speculate something and in in the course of a speculation we shall we shall we shall get lost uh, and we shall um, we shall uh, uh, not find the direction uh, the way to, to to the goal where to which we are uh, we are going and that is not the way of a philosopher society no philosophy does not mean only to criticize the predecessors kant is a critic is a, in a very in another sense kant is not a critic for the for the sake of criticism so don't philosophize just ask you to yourself the external world or the object whether the external world exist or does not exist that is also separate thing my sense organs perceive the something perceive something outside and it collect my sense organs collect the sense data it is a fact or there is anything science or philosophy in it this is the question kant says it is a fact yes in my daily life i experience that whenever i am i am waking up from my bed from the very very beginning of the day i uh, i experience yes i when i open my eye i see the tree i see the building i see i i collect the data from my sense organs this fact should not be ignored cannot be ignored and should not be ignored we shall accept this number 1 number 2 is it the only fact is it the only fact the second question is it the only fact yes if this is the fact then the question comes is it the only fact only the is um, um, only is only the perception is source of knowledge this second question comes then also i experience no these sense data are discrete these sense data are discrete in in this point kant supports david hume that yes i admit the sense data are discrete but that is the that is the premise that is not the conclusion david hume made this statement as the conclusion hume um, kant says i admit you i i agree with you that yes sense data are discrete but 
they are they are organized they are organized the discrete sense organ david hume says there is no logical connection between the discrete sensations kant says discrete sensations or discrete sense data are to be organized are to be organized through mind so that is a role of mind it is not a philosophy it is a fact when can we see this fact when we are silent when we are silent so descartes descartes and kant they started from their philosophy from silence from silence they were meditative by nature they were very much meditative they were they were impartial they were they were very much honest when descartes said says about universal doubt he rejected a speaking about to the reconciliation but kant is become very much impartial kant is not advocating implicitism nor rejecting implicitism neither he is advocating rationalism nor he is um criticizing rationalism kant says forget implicitism and forget rationalism come to come to your own uh, uh, own uh, experience what do you experience in your experience you see that yes you have sense organs and you have a mind man is a psychophysical organism man has mind and man has sense organs sense organs sense organs have contribution and mind has its contribution sense organs collect data sense data and these sense data these sense data are organized are to be organized by the mind this is this is the method of the kant by this way he reconciled empiricism with rationalism that both are necessary only perception cannot give us knowledge and if we shall accept if we shall accept perception as the source of knowledge then the then many problems will take place if we shall say that only uh, innate ideas or a priori ideas or origin are the source of uh, knowledge then that will also lead to many problems and be very practical and see that the actually knowledge is knowledge is formed knowledge is formed by both empiricism and rationalism yes i need my sense organs which give us which give us sense data which supply sense data and these sense data are are organized suppose i is grass and a green but unless i organize grass with green in as a judgment that grass is green if these two sense data are not uh, logically connected then we cannot have complete knowledge they should be synthesized in mind this is one step then kant says do our sense organs free are our are our sense organs free to perceive anything they like this is this question comes in the first part kant said both perception and um, origin both per perception and origin both are required for knowledge sense organs and mind both are required to form knowledge second in the second session second part kant is asking the question are our sense organs free to perceive anything is our mind free to conceptualize anything here comes the critical part yes i accept i accept that sense organs are required sense organs provide us the sense data yes mind is 
but is the mind free to conceptualize anything are the sense organs free to um, perceive anything to perceive anything the, the, to the, to the, to these questions kant says no sense organs cannot perceive everything sense organs are not free to perceive anything sense organs can perceive things that come under space and time and mind can conceptualize um, anything that comes under the forms of a understanding that is the revelation kant made in philosophy before kant before kant when when we were speaking of uh, sense organs um, perception as the source of knowledge there was a freedom that yes sense organ can perceive anything mind can conceive anything this freedom is lost in kant kant said mind is not that free mind is not so free to conceptualize anything else that does mind cannot speculate anything as the speculative philosophy or speculations are concerned can't um, check that can't regulate that can't guide that that no mind is restricted to certain forms of understanding and sense organs are restricted to certain forms of uh, perception there comes these two forms are known as sensibility and understanding sensibility and understanding knowledge knowledge is formal knowledge is formal and the forms of knowledge according to kant one is sensibility and the other is understanding yes i admit that both perception and uh, empiricism and the rationalism both are required but empiricism is not not is not not empiricism and rationalism they do not have free hands to um, to perceive or conceive according to their choices whatever we perceive we perceive through to a priori forms that is space and time whatever i perceive i perceive through space and time Space. I whatever the the object of my perception, the object of my perception is a spaced object and a timed object. I perceive the spaced object and the timed object. Similarly, whatever I understand, I understand my understanding is a categorized understanding. My understanding is a categorized understanding. both are required both the instruments are required but but both the instruments are not free are not free so here here comes the boundary the boundary means what can be known and what cannot be known i shall take both in spite of taking both both the parties empiricism and rationalism still it is not sufficient to know the reality as it is because it is it is kant is so honest that it is he according to him this is not a philosophy this is the fact this is the fact of our experience if we shall look into the fact deeply all of us whenever kant speaks something kant does not speak for himself neither in immorality nor in intellectuality nor in about metaphysics nor about anything else whatever kant speaks kant says that a layman can also think in that way just you experience just you experience that you collect you call you experience um, you experience the limits limitation of uh, your perception and the limitation of your conception you cannot perceive anything you like you cannot conceive anything you like that freedom you don't have that is the cognitive limitation that is the cognitive limitation so so far as my so far as my perception is concerned so far as my perception is concerned 
I shall perceive that which comes under the two a priori forms. A priori form means uh, a priori form means the form that helps me to perceive, but that is not perceived. As the as the as I I see everything through my eye, but I cannot see my eye. As the video camera video camera can uh, take photo of everything, but the video camera cannot take the photograph of of the camera itself. That is a priori. A priori means the the um, uh, the source is not perceived and the source is not conceived. But without that source, perception and conception are not possible. So, if there is, if there is, a, if there is an a priori form of our perception, if there is an a priori form of our perception, if there is, if there is an a priori form of our perception, our perception is formal and our conception is formal. Formal means, formal means it is restricted to certain, restricted to the, our limitations. Now come to the third stage. The vast world is before us. What much? What 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 much we can see? What uh, uh, what is the range of my perception? What can I see? I can perceive that which only comes under space and time. So here, the things that are beyond space and time, they remain unperceived. They remain unperceived. Suppose, suppose, they, suppose, suppose, uh, um, uh, 2,000 or 2 lakh students uh, appeared in the IS examination. So in the in the first examination, in the first part of the preliminary examination, uh, only 2,000 people, uh, students were selected. Then these 2,000 students will appear in the main examination. So all others cannot attend. And out of these 2,000 students, only 200 students will, uh, will, will get that civil service. So, the, in the past examination, that is the perception, many things were left out from my perception. I just collect the data which are available, but Of they are called space and uh, time. In the next session, um, Madam will uh, say about space and time and the categories in details. So these are the forms of my perception. About whatever is collected, whatever the sense that whatever is collected through these forms, they will be organized, they will be scrutinized, they will be categorized through the my forms of understanding. Mind is a mind has also certain forms of understanding like substance, causality, etc. And the things which are only eligible to these forms, they will become they will become my knowledge. So knowledge is the scrutinized knowledge. Knowledge is not that whatever you know that is your knowledge. So that is not knowledge. Knowledge means the knowledge through space and time in the past stage and through the 12 categories of understanding. This is the uniqueness of Kant's philosophy. Kant, in the past stage, Kant made a reconciliation between empiricism and rationalism. And Kant made a revolution that is called Copernican revolution. Copernican revolution is Copernican revolution is symbolic by nature. In in astronomy, 
there was a uh, revolution um, that Ptolemy, Ptolemy uh, advocated that the earth is the center and uh, that was also accepted at that time and uh, after many years Copernicus came and Copernicus say, said that uh, sun is the center. So this is a very well-known uh, debate and a well-known discovery uh, and that is that uh, in Oh, and the it, it was the just opposite whether the earth was center and sun was sun and other planets were revolving around the earth and the just opposite view is that the sun is the center and the uh, earth and other planets uh, revolve, revolve around the uh, around sun so exactly the same type of revolution uh, is uh, made by immanuel kant Kant said that my sense organs and the mind do not have three hands uh, for perception and conception. They are formalized. Knowledge is formalized. In order to know the object, the object, objects must confirm, the objects must approach, the objects must qualify the a priori forms of our perception and the a priori forms of our minds. But before that, that was not the situation. Sense organs and the mind, uh, we are free to perceive and conceive. And that uh, was leading to dogmatism, speculation, etc., etc. Kant, as a critical philosopher, checked, checked all types of dogmatic attitude and uh, speculative attitude uh, of um, the uh, attitude in philosophical inquiry. So that was the, the so in the very symbolic is, uh, so Copernican revolution, the very name is a symbolic. Its, its meaning is that uh, the, as the, um, in astronomy such a revolution was made between Ptolemy and Copernicus, similarly Kant made a revolution in philosophy by asserting the status of uh, um, uh, our perception and conception, uh, which was different from the uh, views of uh, his predecessors. So Kant said, that uh, we cannot perceive everything. We cannot conceive everything. Our perception is formalized by our percepts of space and time, and uh, our, our conceptions are whatever mind thinks, um, make whenever, whenever mind, mind makes judgments, and, and mind knows anything, that is, that is scrutinized by the forms of understandings. So that is called transcendentalism because beyond, uh, because beyond our perception and conception, there are certain a priori forms which are not, which are neither perceived nor conceived. We cannot help, mind cannot help, mind cannot help thinking without the form. And our sense organs cannot help perceiving without forms. This is the this is the limit of our perception and conception. Therefore, Kant says the limit of thought, the limit of uh, thought, is not the limit of uh, um, our explanations. The limit of explanations is not the limit of our thought. Our thought is much wider. Whatever we explain, whatever we know, whatever we describe, whatever mind comes to know, that is only through the forms of understanding. This is the cognitive aspect of, a, um, of a man. Man has three aspects, cognitive, cognitive, and a affective, and this is the cognitive aspect of a man. But Kant says, that man is not only a man, man is not only a philosopher, man is not only um, concerned with knowledge. If this is the status of knowledge, we cannot say that I know the noumena. I cannot, I, we cannot say that I know the uh, thing in 
thing as it is, but so here the belief and the knowing, believing and the knowing. So Kant believes in knowing and believing. So Kant believes, yes, I can believe that there is God, there is world, there is soul. And with that regard, he has um, said about the um, um, uh, uh, rational psychology, rational cosmology, rational theology, all these things Kant has, Kant has discussed because belief is also a faculty of a uh, man. So man can be religious, man can be moral, man can be uh, man can man should have aesthetic sense all these things will be there but so far as the cognition is concerned we should know the limit of our knowledge the limit of our knowledge is not the limit of our belief yes i can believe in god but i can say that i know god i can believe in cosmology but I can't say that I know cosmology because knowledge has its own limitation. Okay. Now, what is the result? If this is the method, then what is the result? The result is synthetic a priori judgment. And so far we, we are we, so far we discussed, uh, we discussed about the method. We discussed about the um, revolution. We discussed about the contribution of Descartes, um, the contribution of Immanuel Kant to the history of philosophy. Um, but now, what is the result? What is the result out of this discussion? Kant says that now, out of this exercise, we came to the point that we can have synthetic a priori judgment. There, there is a distinction between our propositions as analytic and synthetic, a priori and a posteriori. Analytic statement, analytic and synthetic statement is based upon meaning. A priori and a posteriori distinction is based upon truth. If the meaning of a, meaning of the subject and predicate is identical, then it is analytic. If the predicate speaks something new about the subject, it is synthetic. So a we are concerned with meaning and truth. A proposition has meaning and a proposition has truth. So from the standpoint of a meaning, we can we can. Um, make a distinction between analytic and synthetic profession. That analytic profession is one in which the meaning of subject predicate is identical. That means the predicate does not uh, give, speak uh, anything new. The predicate just repeats the meaning of the subject. And synthetic in a synthetic profession, the predicate um, gives a new information about the subject. Grass is grass. Uh, it is analytic, but grass is green, it is synthetic, because grass is not a green. Greenness is, is, greenness is said about grass. Greenness is the information about grass. What a grass is, now grass is green. So this is synthetic. But when we discuss about a priori and a posteriori, that is based upon truth. If the truth of a proposition is known independent of experience. Independent of experience, then that is a priori, or which is universal and necessary by nature, that is a priori. When the truth of a proposition is dependent on experience, that is a posteriori, or which is objective by nature, that is a posteriori. So out of these fourfold, uh, twofold distinctions, uh, uh, analytic statements are generally a priori. Analytic statements are generally a priori, and synthetic statements are generally a posteriori. This was discussed before Kant.
Kant made a revolution by saying that synthetic professions, the synthetic a priori um, 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 possibility, uh, synthetic a priori proposition is also possible. Synthetic a priori statement is possible. Synthetic and a priori statement is possible. Synthetic means something which is based upon which is based upon perception. As we have discussed, that knowledge starts from perception. Knowledge, knowledge starts from perception, ends in region, ends in region through through understanding. There are three faculties. One is um, uh, perception, second is understanding, and the third one is region. So the meaning of region is something different here. So I shall not go to that. Um, from there are three ideas of region: God, world, and soul. Um, that is, we shall discuss later. So here, uh, synthetic a priori means synthetic means the knowledge is based upon perception, experience, experience, and a priori means. There is there is a form. There is a there is an there is a uh, an a priori form which regulates our perception and conception. But we we discussed it before. Now Kant says that synthetic a priori knowledge is possible in that way. But what should be an analytic profession should be a priori, and synthetic propositions should be a posteriori. But Kant made a revolution by saying that this is the result of Kant um, uh, out of his discussion that synthetic a priori knowledge is possible. Where it is possible? Kant says it is possible in mathematics and physics and it is not possible in metaphysics. So by this method, by this method Kant says that scientific knowledge or uh, scientific knowledge about metaphysics is not possible scientifically we cannot establish metaphysics but but we can believe in metaphysics we can love metaphysics i can believe in god i can love god but scientifically i cannot establish god epistemologically i cannot establish god God, 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 as an example of metaphysics, anything metaphysics, anything no mena, that cannot be established by uh, by scientific approach. By this, what is the scientific approach of knowledge? Now, the scientific approach of knowledge is knowledge should be synthetic and a priori. But man is not only concerned. Man is not only concerned with knowledge. Man has emotion. Man has emotion. Man has also willing. Therefore, Kant is Kant says that human self is both phenomenal and nominal. We have two selves. As, as it is said in Adita Vedanta, Jiva and Atman. Jiva and Atman. Similarly, Kant says that man has a phenomenal self and a nominal self. The phenomenal self, the phenomenal self is concerned with synthetic a priori method. In, from the standpoint of the phenomenal self, man cannot scientifically ascertain the existence of a God, soul, and the world. But within him, there is a nominal self which can love, which can believe in metaphysics. There is no harm. Man can believe. And belief is cannot be criticized by others. My belief is my belief. I believe that there is a nomena, and that is my belief. But I cannot say that I know that that is nomena. So nomena, nomena is unknown and unknowable. But no, no, we cannot say that nomena is unbelievable. No, I. We can believe in metaphysics. We can believe in God. We can believe in immortality of a soul. Therefore, Kant said, existence of a God, immortality of a soul, are the, um, and the freedom of the will are the postulates of a morality. 
so far as the morality is concerned we can we can believe we can believe not know we can believe that god is there and we can believe in the existence of god we can believe in the immortality of the soul and that they are the um, secondary postulates of morality and the primary postulate of morality is the freedom of will freedom of will that i have a self nominal self and that self has a will has a will um, and that will is free i have a, i have i have my will is free and from the freedom uh, when the will is free one can be moral so so the kant's philosophy is very comprehensive kant's philosophy includes everything all the aspects of human life are included in kant's philosophy kant is critical in the sense that we um, when implicit philosophers say that sense experience is the only source of knowledge kant criticized it when rationalist philosophers uh, rationalist philosophers claim that reason is the only source of knowledge kant criticized it when philosophers say that we know the metaphysics kant criticized it but kant is not a critic in that sense kant is not so hard by heart kant is very soft hearted kant is a very loving person kant is very honest kant gives justice to all the aspects of human life kant says yes so far as my knowledge apparatus is concerned i am i should be aware of the limit of my knowledge but but i have also emotion i have also my belief belief um, system i can believe something okay so that is discussed in practical religion and uh, also kant uh, is very much aware of the aesthetic sense that how the nature is beautiful how there is beauty in the nature how the human personality is beautiful uh, all these things are also discussed in a, um, uh, the critic of a judgment many people do, many students our students do not know these aspects all students are only uh, concerned with the critic of pure reason and they only know that yes the phenomena is uh, knowable and the noumena is unknown and unknowable uh, so uh, th- this is not what kant is uh, kant is very much um, famous about uh, his uh, critic of pure reason when we discuss categorical imperative uh, his um, uh, moral st- uh, philosophy kant is very much um, very much familiar in that sense uh, okay um, so now synthetic knowledge should be synthetic and a priori and it is possible in mathematics for example 7 plus 5 is equal to 12 7 plus 5 is equal to 12 why it is why it is uh, a, a priori because this this is such a statement a priori means it must be universal necessary according to according to implicit philosophers knowledge is objective not universal necessary according to rational philosophers knowledge is universal and necessary not objective kant says knowledge should be universal necessary and objective if we say something as knowledge then that should be universal necessary and objective so these three uh, will be fulfilled if we say that knowledge is synthetic a priori a priori means knowledge is universal and necessary synthetic means knowledge is objective now we have to see how a mathematical statement is synthetic a priori so for example uh, 7 plus 5 is equal to 12 how it is a priori because 7 for plus 5 must be 12 must be 12 must be means it cannot be 11 it cannot be 13 it must be 12 so there is a, and it, it is universally true wherever you go for in 
हरे देर इज नो कंडीशन इविन कैंट से इविन गॉड कैन नॉट सस्पेंड इट इफ गॉड इज अंडर दिस प्रिंसिपल मैथमेटिकल प्रिंसिपल्स दैट गॉड कैन नॉट रिजेक्ट इट सेवेन प्लस फाइव इज इक्वल टू ट्वेल्व मीन्स सेवेन प्लस फाइव इज इक्वल टू ट्वेल्व somebody will say suppose um, so it is very um, it is it is an it is a habit 7 plus 5 is equal to 12 everybody knows 2 plus 2 is equal to 4 everybody knows so there is not no if uh, this is a small equation therefore uh, it is very easy to know suppose we shall take a very big uh, sum as the calculator in the calculator we calculate very big sum suppose um, Um, we shall take a very b um, long digits then we cannot uh, speak of the result so but whatever will be the result that will be the result that will be the result the result is unknown the result is unknown the result is is unknown but whatever will be the result will be the result that is the universal and the necessary but how it is synthetic a synthetic in the sense the predicate is not identical with the subject because the meaning of a 7 plus 5 and the meaning of a 12 appears to be same appears to be same as it is very this equation is familiar to our experience suppose in case of a complex equation the predicate gives us a new information therefore we calculate therefore we calculate suppose we are going to a shop and we purchase many things then we we need to know what is the total amount so that is the information we we get by by summing up the um, all the digits so it is synthetic and a priori and this is also possible in physics for example every event must have a cause every event must have a cause if here it is a priori because cause it is it it, in, it includes an a priori form that is causation causation is a which is included here in this knowledge so it is a priori and when we see when we speak every every means universal whatever is an event it must have a cause so this is universal because we are speaking about every there is no exception it is universal and how it is synthetic because the meaning of event and the meaning of cause is different the meaning of the event and the meaning of the cause is di different the predicate gives us a new information new meaning in this way he also said that in geometry um, synthetic a priori knowledge is also possible that a, a, a triangle uh, has uh, three angles a triangle has three angles uh, yes it is necessary and it is universal because wherever there is a triangle it must have three angles it must have three angles and the meaning of a triangle and angle are not same triangle is not angle angle is not triangle in that sense it is synthetic but wherever there is a triangle it must have three angles it must have three angles it is universal and necessary but we cannot say that this is possible in metaphysics by applying this method kant eliminated the knowledge of metaphysics that we cannot have the knowledge of metaphysics our knowledge is limited to physics and even in physics our knowledge is only confined to the appearance not the reality we do not know metaphysics even if we claim that we know physics in physical world also we can reach only the appearance not the reality because whatever we perceive we perceive through space and time and whatever we conceive we conceive through the 12 categories of understanding so by this way by this way kant kant uh, made very much clear about the limitation of human knowledge that this is the limit of human knowledge in the next sessions in the next sessions um, 
other concepts of uh, other questions of other parts of uh, Immanuel Kant will be discussed by other speakers. So I may conclude here actually uh, I was blank. I do not know what I said. Um, so uh, I just said uh, from my own understanding, from my memory, what I have understood Kant. I, I have said it without preparation. Please excuse me if he, uh, I have not given justice to Kant, particularly in this session, uh, I was totally blank. Because uh, today we shifted home from hospital uh, after 12 days uh, of staying in hospital. And all the, my previous two talks, uh, I had delivered when I was in hospital. Thank you, thank you all. Uh, now uh, I shall request uh, the moderators to um, to start uh, question and session, but I need only two minutes break. Just I am coming. Uh, just two minutes. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Hello. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am, we are audible. Uh, so I am really thankful to our speaker, Sri Pramod Kumar Agar, sir, for his uh, uh, most ocean knowledge regarding. Madam, wait, wait, wait a minute. He is not there. He is not there. Let him, let him come back. He is not there. Let him come back. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Hello. Shall I start? Yes, yes, madam. I can see Hello. Shall I start? Yes, okay, madam. Start. Yes, madam. Start, madam. Okay, okay. Okay. Uh, so I am really thankful to Sri Pramod Kumar Dasa for his vast knowledge in the philosophy of Immanuel Kant from uh, the from Vekan uh, to uh, all the touching, all the rationalist and empiricist philosophy, their methodology and the weaknesses of their methodology so that it prompts to Kant to talk about transcendentalism or criticism. And again, uh, when we discuss, uh, when he discussed about uh, the philosophy of Kant, he touched all the points that is metaphysics, epistemology, and uh, he initially he began uh, his deliberation on epistemology, how he combines, how for him uh, to have a knowledge proper, there must be beautiful amalgamation of both conception and perception that he beautifully explained. And uh, regarding when he talked about metaphysics, and he very emphatically asserted that metaphysics as a science is not, is not at all possible but as a human disposition, it is inevitable, it has to be there. And talking about even he also uh, touched all the points of uh, um, uh, um, Kant as a moral thinker, where we can, where he talked of universalizability as a principle, as an ethical principle. And uh, he also talked about how uh, for a knowledge proper, we have to fulfill that two criteria or two a priori forms of our perception and 12 categories. And the very beautiful thing that I have pointed out here uh, regarding which our students really they have doubts that is the, the why we say that his philosophical approach is a Copernican revolution because he summed it in a very beautiful way that is instead of mind approaching the objects, the object must approach the mind that is the reason for which we say that he made a Copernican revolution in philosophy. So uh, uh, I can only I can only salute the level of clarity that um, uh, Pramod sir is carrying with him, 
and uh, the 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 um, the confidence the convinc the conviction that uh, that he carries uh, i salute him now moving on to the now the the topic is open for discussion and moving on to the question and answer session i request uh, mrs nivedita priyadarshini uh, to take over and uh, moderate the uh, question and answer session nivedita priyadarshini please thank you sir Sir, presentation. This will be more helpful to us. Topic is Sir Rajya Mr. Uh, he asked, what are the problems of empiricism and rationalism? If we go with one partially, I need to highlight in his philosophy. No, we have discussed that. We have discussed that. Anyway, <clears throat> the problem of empiricism and the problem of rationalism. Yes, <clears throat> in empiricism, we have ignored the faculty of our rational thinking. In rational, in rationalism, we have ignored the objective world where we live in. Can't, can't reconcile both implicit and rationalism. Can't say, can't say that I agree with what both of you affirm, and I disagree with what both of you uh, deny. Implicit philosophers affirm that sense experience is the only source of knowledge, and religion is not, not. Sense experience has no role, uh, so that was the problem. So can't can't made this uh, uh, can't took this problem and solved it. We in the in the name of rationalization, in the name of a priori um, a priori or innate innate ideas. We cannot ignore the objective world where we live in. We should be very practical. Are ma, ye one patient is admitted in hospital. He needs oxygen. He or she needs oxygen. He or needs seat a blood. I will say in that idea, in that idea, we will give blood and oxygen to the patient. We need the external world where we live in. Okay, so. The objective world cannot be ignored, and the rational thinking, the faculty of thinking, cannot be ignored. In Kant's philosophy, both are honored. Both sense experience and reason are honored, and both of them, Kant says, this is not my philosophy. This is the fact of life. Everybody can experience that. Uh, in our knowledge process situation, in our knowledge process, we need both experience um, and uh, reason. Without perception, there is a saying, uh, without uh, conception, without perception is blind, perception without conception is empty. So, Kant's philosophy is neither blind nor empty. Okay, next question. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, he also asked another question uh, that uh, even if we believe in metaphysics, which is not supported by science, can it be called knowledge? Hmm, very good question. <clears throat> Meta me metaphysics is not supported by science. Therefore, it is not knowledge. It it is not our knowledge, but it should be our belief. It should be our belief. 
Kant says, knowledge is not the only faculty of life. We cannot live our life only being knowledgeable. Faith, belief also contribute to our peaceful living. Therefore, in another two critics, critic of a pure reason, a critic of a practical reason, and critic of understanding, Emmanuel Kant has emphasized what is not knowledge, what is feeling, feeling, morality, emotion, love, beauty, all these things are discussed by Kant. So Kant is very much, uh, Kant's philosophy is very much comprehensive by nature. Kant is not only confined to uh, the source of knowledge like David Hume and others. Okay, sir. Thank you. Uh, the next question is by Amrita Haldar, ma'am. Okay, yeah, asked, yeah. Uh, what is the thing Nibedita. in itself? Hello. And thing in... Nibedita. Yes, sir. Nibedita. Yes, sir. The, the question which was asked, the metaphysics which is not supported by science. Metaphysics which is not supported yes, by yes, science. Yes, yes, Raja Mr. Huh. Can metaphysics be, yes, be ever supported by science? Science, if we, if we say science, how can we speak of metaphysics? Metaphysics, physics will be supported by science. Meta, how can we say that metaphysics is supported by science? Metaphysics can never be supported by science. Okay. We, we can believe in, we can believe in that. Okay. Hmm. Yes. Uh, the next question is by Amrita Haldar, ma'am. They ask, what is the thing in itself and thing in themselves in Kant's understanding? Thing in itself means a thing which is, uh, the, the, the thing which is not perceived. Thing in itself means the thing which is not perceived, which is not known to us. Whatever is known to us is the thing that appears to us. The thing in itself is not known to us. So thing in itself means a thing which is not perceived. Yes. There are two Next things. question is by Nanda Gosar. Um, yes, sir. Hello. Hmm. Uh, the next question is by Nanda Gosar. He asked, uh, uh, he wants an explanation the difference between transcendental and immanent metaphysics. And he has an, another question also. How Kant establishes his saying that all our experiences are possible for synthetic apparent. Uh, your, uh, your sound is fluctuating. Uh, I could not hear the second question. Placement, all our okay, I am sorry. Yes, he asked how Kant establishes saying that all our ex hello. Uh -huh. Okay, okay, okay. I, I, I read, I read, I read. I read his question. Uh, what is the difference between transcendental and immanent metaphysics? Transcendental and immanent metaphysics. The word transcendental is uh, used in Kant's philosophy in a very different sense. Transcendental means, in Kant, transcendental means something which is the ground of our perception, ground of our knowledge. For example, uh, we perceive something through space and time, but space and time are not perceived. We, we conceive through categories of understandings, but these categories are not conceived. They, in that sense, these are transcendental. In that sense, they are transcendental. So transcendental here, is epistemological. But in uh, other philosophy, 
we take transcendental in the metaphysical sense uh, transcendental metaphysics uh, by transcendental metaphysics we shall say that uh, metaph that's that reality that re that uh, object of a um, no 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 by transcendental metaphysics we shall say that which which remained which remained unknown to our uh, faculty of knowing which remained unknown to our faculty of knowing that is transcendental metaphysics and i don't understand what is immanent metaphysics i don't understand immanent metaphysics um, i don't understand okay i don't understand sorry sorry hello sir can i help you oh. hello Hi. sir uh, uh, from okay. sir thank you sir hello uh, yes sir uh, yes, 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 yes madam actually uh, actually i understand this in this way uh, i am i am trying to help namde guru sir actually we never do talk of uh, transcendental and immanent metaphysics rather we talk of descriptive and revisionary metaphysics ah okay yeah, yeah. immanent metaphysics i don't know what is yeah this is not there yeah. and the second question is how kant establishes he is saying that all our experiences are possible all our experiences are possible for synthetic a priori judgments uh please makes all our knowledge possible knowledge possible uh, yes synthetic a priori knowledge is possible in mathematics geometry and physics kant has focused but uh, that is not possible in metaphysics i have i have discussed that synthetic a priori judgment synthetic means we cannot ignore perception a priori means we cannot ignore the forms of perception or forms of knowledge whenever we know we need the object of knowledge but the object of knowledge should conform to the a priori forms of our understanding and a priori forms of our perceiving and conceiving in that sense it is synthetic and a priori synthetic means synthetic means my knowledge is objective clear i know something that is, that is synthetic and whatever i knew i knew through the a priori conditions of knowing in that sense it is a priori in every situation in every knowledge situation we get that but about metaphysics when we speak of a god world um, soul we cannot uh, apply synthetic a priori knowledge there so synthetic a priori knowledge is the method which um, which uh, uh, made a distinction between phenomena and the noumena whatever we know through our synthetic a priori process that is only phenomenal that is only phenomenal by nature we cannot have synthetic a priori knowledge about noumena next thank you sir uh, the next question by dr manwar sir he uh, Uh, he asked can divides reason into speculative and pure reason critic of pure reason that reason contains not only ideas but ideals also he wants an explanation of this statement ha uh, in in critic of pure reason kant does not speak of a speculative reason i have never uh, read such thing in critic of pure reason kant speaks of a um, pure reason not speculative reason 
speculative reason comes in uh, practical reason when he speaks about god world and soul i think so when sometimes questions confuse us when i when when we when i doubt whether such things are there in text or not acha i i request kalyani madam if you know please sir, clarify sir, sir may i speak yes 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 sir yes sir okay, okay thank you sir sir actually, actually can't when say speculative reason it means that uh, whatever we uh, whatever you perceive as synthetic a priori whatever knowledge we get as synthetic a priori and when he says pure reason he talks only about the ideas which are given transcendently like uh, god soul and freedom so that is the dividation so the god soul and the world does not come under critical pure that, reason that that sir uh, excuse me sir that that is a statement in critical pure reason when he says that uh, reason contains not only ideas but ideals also no 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 if you speak about god world and soul that does not come that discussion does not come under critical pure reason ji ji okay so so when you are asking a question you should justify sir, the question he, sir actually he finishes with these questions no no no, no, no. I, I, i have made it very much clear that in critic of a pure reason in critic of a pure reason can't speaks this much in critic of a practical reason can't speaks of this much and in critic of a judgment can't speaks this much exactly, so exactly. Uh, so uh, so so we should not confuse yeah. one critic with another critic oh, right right okay that should okay, not be therefore therefore i told uh, kant was very honest as a philosopher kant said when not only kant, not kant said i am saying asking question is very important than giving answer when you are asking a question don't confuse don't confuse because suppose we we read a statement uh, what is are in what sense uh, uh, who said that suppose why messi has written it suppose arkepati has written a book they have described kant's philosophy but when we are discussing kant in original kant's critic of pure reason in kant's critic of pure reason kant is only discussing about the cognitive apparatus of man what should be the knowledge what should be the nature of knowledge abo and what is left what is left in the scientific knowledge that is discussed in critical for practical reason what is left in in practical reason that is discussed in critical critical for judgment in that sense kant has given justice to human life man life human life is not only uh, knowledge oriented human life is filled up uh, with emotion love sacrifice compassion kindness therefore kant is very much famous for his morality than his philosophy uh, okay i just uh, i just um, uh, i i spoke this as a friend not uh, don't take it otherwise because we are all we are also philosophers thank you thank you thank you uh sir he also sir he also wants to know the um uh he wants an explanation of the transcendental idealism which is claimed by kant transcendental idealism yes 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 that is a very good question I, 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 that is a very good question, and I, I appreciate this question. It was against Berkeley. Berkeley spoke of subjective idealism. It was against Berkeley. Berkeley speaks of subjective idealism, and um, uh, also against those philosophers who um, who advocated objective idealism. But Kant's philosophy is transcendental idealism. Here, here. kant says that our knowledge process has a certain a priori conditions
fundamental means some the element that helps us knowing is not known i gave the example that the video camera which shoots everything is not um, which picture, which takes pictures of everything <laughs> itself in the process of knowing we are taking the help of certain forms certain elements which are not subject to our perception and conception kant's transcendentalism means that next uh so the next question is by k o narayan rao sir uh if the mind moves to the objects in order to know the objects then what problem arises in the philosophy of kant if mind moves to the object mind does not move mind does not move mind was moving before kant in all the predecessors kant made a revolution that objects move to the mind those objects who qualify to uh, who um, who um, the objects should approach the forms of minds in kant mind does not move to the objects rather objects move to mind the reverse the reverse is true before kant it was said that mind was responsible for knowing but in, in kant time in ha, through space and time ha it is just the opposite so kant made this revelation kant said in the knowledge process the objects to be known and the object to be the object of knowledge an object to be the object of knowledge should conform to the a priori forms of a understanding those who will qualify the interview will get the service here not that the management will give the appointment by taking uh, donation that was before kant no that is not no that is not the point what was actually that is the revolution that he made that the objects have to move to the mind in order to be known but what is the problem if mind moves to the object he made the revolution okay why that revolution okay i understand that the objects have to move to the mind in order to be qualified by the mind by the categories and also by the a priori forms of understanding oh, but what is okay, the okay. what is the problem if the mind moves to the object that is the problem ha that ha uh, now ha uh, if this is the question then this question is meaningful now his question is if he, if the mind moves to the object to know then what is the problem the problem is if mind moves to know everything then if mind is free to think everything that i i said that in kant says that our mind is not free to conceptualize everything our sense organs are not free to sense everything then what will happen if our mind is free to uh, think everything or a mind moves to object uh, so that will lead to speculations without logic without reason therefore therefore we have speculations therefore we have speculative views in order to avoid that speculation in order to make our knowledge scientific what is the problem the problem will be unscientific if mind will move to the object and will have its autonomy to describe anything as it likes that it will be unscientific by its approach it will go in any direction it will be speculative by nature it will not be scientific it will not be logical so kant kant by making this revelation made the philosophy scientific this is the uh, this is the problem and this is the uh, merit rao sir did you did you get or not sir now you are now you are clear now you are okay now you are okay now now your response is okay Response is okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. This question is why he asked. What are the ways? Uh, 
Friday is become possible. Since how synthetic AI knowledge is possible? Is it a question to discuss? I mean, it is a question for the sake of a question. It is already said in the in the talk. So should I repeat that again and again? How synthetic AI knowledge is possible? Uh, okay, just. Sir, you have already discussed. Sir, you have already said, already discussed twice. Question. I request sir, all. Please move on to the next question. Huh. Sir, please it's... move on to the next question. Acha, what does Kant mean by transcendental? I have, I have already answered. Yes, sir. I have already answered to um, the previous questioner. Transcendental, transcendental idealism. Yes. Sir. What is transcendental by Kant? It is already answered. Uh, the... Yes. Sir. Thank you, sir. Ratnakar Gajendra sir, question. Russell is yes, criticizing Kant. Yes, sir. Uh, the next thing is why Gajendra. Asked that philosophy not in terms of science, subordinate to his philosophical. What is his philosophical? Ratnakar Gajendra is asking a question that I am reading now, but the voice of an abita is not clear. Russell is criticizing Kant that philosophy is to be judged. Not in terms of logic and science, they are subordinate to his philosophical vision. What is his philosophical vision? What is what is his philosophical vision? His means what? Russell's or Kant's? It is not clear. Anyway, if Russell Kant's Kant, huh? What is Kant's philosophical vision? Acha. Ah, Kant's philosophical vision. What is the what is the philosophical vision of a Kant? This is the central theme of my talk today. I am repeat. I have repeatedly said that the philosophical vision of Kant, Kant, Kant does not say that this is my philosophy. Kant says be this. Observe your knowing process. What you you speak? What you really observe? What you really experience? What you really experience? So. Very pragmatically, very practically, if we shall observe the process of knowing, the process of knowing, we shall say that uh, we cannot ignore the um, um, ignore the contribution of mind, and we cannot ignore the contribution of a perception. Both perception and a, uh, reason are necessary for our knowledge. Okay. Therefore, it is scientific. Therefore, it is not speculative. And what Russell criticized, Russell criticized uh, in not in terms of our logic and science. Many philosophers will philosophers will criticize other philosophers. So we shall not discuss the criticisms of other philosophers. We shall discuss what is the contribution of Kant. This is the contribution of Kant. So Hegel will criticize Kant. Bradley will criticize Kant. We shall discuss when we shall discuss Hegel, Bradley, or Russell. Here we shall discuss what is the contribution of a Kant to the mankind. Okay. What are the conditions under which? Uh, so these are the questions. I think the question ends here. Uh, yeah, Nibedita. Hello? Nibidita, your, your sound is not clear. You you mute yourself. I am reading and I am answering. Listen. I shall read and answer. Your sound is not uh, clear. Uh, you just mute and listen. Huh. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Another question. Uh... Okay. Then, then give vote of thanks. Then, then thank me. <laughs> okay. Then thank me. Yes. Hello. <laughs> yes, sir. Hello. Sir. If Hello? there is no question, yes, then thank me. Okay, Nibirita, shall I start? Uh, over to Kalyan. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes ma'am. Yes, sir. Thank you, Nibirita. Uh, uh, I am thankful to 
Nivedita uh, for very nicely uh, fitting for the question in question and association. And I am thankful to the research person of today, uh, Sri Pramod Kumar uh, Das sir, for his uh, for highlighting the intricate delicacies of the philosophy of Immanuel Kant and giving justice by showing the dynamic dimensions of the uh, philosophy of Kant. I am really thankful, sir, for your um, understanding. And for your way of expressing and making the a very difficult subject, which is full of technicalities, which is full of technical words, making the subject very easy for the participants. So I am thank you, sir, from the core of my heart, from the uh, from all the on behalf of all the participants, and I am thankful to the uh, members of the organizing committee and those who have. very nicely and beautifully arranged continuously they are arranging every day such programs i am really thankful to all of them and again we are we wish to uh, in the coming days there are the uh, philosophy of kant session begins from began from today only and in the coming days we are going to see very uh, experts uh, the, those who are going to address on the philosophy of kant and the the i am thankful to all the participants because the number of questions that indicates their interest in the subject and i am thank you to one and all thank you namaskar to all of you thank you thank you thank you